The scripture reading for this morning comes from Hebrews 10, 23 through 31. Again, that's Hebrews 10, 23 through 31. And it reads, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth. There is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Good morning, and welcome to the services here at Charlotte Avenue Church of Christ. It's good to see all of you this morning. Uh, glad that you are here. I hope that uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, we want you to know that you are our honored guest. And we hope that some of you at least have been invited by our members uh, to be here with us. Uh, there may be others of you who are our guests who are uh, passing through and, and maybe still others who you don't know how you wound up here, but, but here you are. Uh, and we're glad that you're here. Of course, brothers and sisters, it is uh, good to see you. As a, it's always good to see our, our brothers and sisters in Christ, our family that meets here at Charlotte Avenue. Uh, all of us here today are here on, on a special day, and it's special because we're worshiping God. Uh, every time we come together to worship God is, is a special day. Uh, but we are going to do something that, that is a little bit different, uh, perhaps. We, we just read a verse, was read to us, uh, about the importance of, of our, our assemblies together, uh, of gathering together. There, there are a lot of different reasons why God's people gather together. Uh, God's people gather, gather together, of course, for worship, uh, maybe just for, for fellowship opportunities, for meals, for uh, service opportunities. God's, God's people get together for uh, a lot of reasons. Uh, but the most important reason is coming together to worship God, uh, to worship, to, to be and to think about uh, who God is and what God is for our lives. So what we want to do this morning, something that is, again, a little different than, than certainly what we normally do, uh, as we go through our worship, I'm going to get up and, and present to you why. Why do we do these things? Uh, why, why do we worship the way that we worship? Uh, for most of us, perhaps it'll simply be a reminder of things that we're aware of. Certainly, most of us who are, are here Sundays and Wednesdays, or at least every week, you're, you're per, pretty familiar with what we do. Uh, but maybe it will be a reminder of the zeal with which we need to do it. Uh, that, that as we come together and, and we sing these songs and we partake in all our acts of worship, that we are, again, worshiping the God of all things, uh, the Creator, uh, remembering our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and, uh, and thankful for God who has done all of these things for us. Uh, Jesus is having a discussion with a, a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 and, and towards the end of that conversation, the, kind of the, the culminating verse, if you will, in John chapter 4 and verse 23, uh, Jesus says to the woman, an hour is coming and now is, which 2,000 years ago it was, which means it is today, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Uh, God is seeking people to worship him. Uh, but not just people who worship him in, in, in any way they, they deem fit, but God is seeking people who worship him in spirit and in truth. So again, this morning we want to explain why do we do the things that we do uh, and, and what does it mean for us? Uh, and again, being a reminder for many of us, but perhaps informing uh, some of you who may be visiting with us and, and all of us, if you have questions about uh, what we do or what is said this morning during our, our, our worship, I encourage you to ask those questions and let's strive to, to understand the things that we do. Uh, one thing we've already done this morning in worship of God is, is sing. Uh, again, it's, it's our, our practice here, our, our tradition, if you will, that the first song, as our, our men who are serving on the table, they, they walk in from where they've been preparing, that we all stand. But we, we start with singing. Uh, singing is a part of our worship, and, and singing has always been a part of worshiping God. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, uh, singing and praising God and lifting our voices in praise to God has always been a part of our worship. Specifically in the New Testament, we have a, a number of verses, and, and here are some that you may want to certainly turn with me here and read these or, or write them down so you can look at them later. In Colossians chapter 3, 
and verse 16. Uh, scripture tells us, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So there's, there's a commandment. We as Christians are commanded to sing. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, a, a similar passage says that we need to speak to one another in psalms and hymns uh, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. So not only do we teach one another, as the, the first verse told us in Colossians, but we also sing and, and praise God, making melody in our hearts to God. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 15, notice not only are we supposed to sing making beautiful sounds, and here, here's something maybe that when we think about singing and, and everyone singing especially, something that some of us may struggle with. Maybe you, you may say, well, you know, I don't, I don't have the best voice or I don't really enjoy singing. Notice what Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 14, 15. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the Spirit and I also pray with the mind and I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the mind also. You see, in reality, the, the beauty of your voice has very little to do with the the worship that we offer to God in singing. Uh, it's nice, and we enjoy it. And if you open a songbook or look up on the, uh, the screen, there, there are notes. And uh, I suggest that we all try and hit those notes uh, to the best of our ability. It'll sound better. We'll, we'll enjoy it. It'll be a, perhaps a more uplifting time. But if we hit the right notes, but we miss the message of the song, then we're really not worshiping how God wants us to worship. Uh, the message of the song. Uh, the, the teaching and admonishing and encouraging one another, the praising and lifting up God through these songs, that's the most important part. Remember, people have worshipped God in song long before there were notes, long before there was melody, long before the people sang like we sing today. Uh, in James chapter 5, in the last part of verse 13, uh, it, it echoes a, a sentiment found in Psalm 98 and Psalm 100 where it says, Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Worship and singing is a, has always been a part of worship. From these verses, here, here's what we can take that Scripture teaches about New Testament Christian worship and singing. That we are to let the Word of Christ richly dwell within us. Well, Paul, Scripture, God, how do we do that? We do that by teaching and admonishing one another. Okay, well, well how do we do that? With psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing thankfully to God. Some of the most important lessons that we'll ever learn in a worship assembly don't come from the preacher, but they come from the time we spend together singing and praising God and, and doing so as a family, doing so as a community of believers. Now, recently, over the last probably five or ten years or so, uh, a cappella singing has become popular. There have been even TV shows that have been entirely about a cappella groups that are, are competing against one another, like other singing competitions, but, but without instruments. And, and you noticed, certainly, whether this is your first time or your millionth time at, a, at this congregation or another Church of Christ, or uh, you have noticed, and, and one of the first things that, that people notice when they come into a Church of Christ is a cappella singing. Uh, where is the where's the organ? Where's the piano? Where's where's the band? Uh, where, where are all these types of things? We we sing a cappella. It has become popular, but it's been around for a long time. Uh, the the word and, and again, some of us are familiar with this. The word a cappella used to mean uh, again when we think about it, we just think of singing without without instruments. But when the word was originally introduced, originally coined, uh, if people were, were out and about it and they they said, "Let's sing a cappella," that meant let's sing like they do at church, and that meant let's sing without instruments. That that's all it meant a cappella. Let's sing like they sing in church. We know from history, uh, we know from from the study of church history that for hundreds of years. After the beginning of the church, after Jesus uh, left the earth and the church was started in Acts chapter 2, for hundreds of years, there were no instruments in any churches at all. And when those instruments began to be introduced, there was great opposition to it because they recognized that from the beginning, there were no instruments. It wasn't that way. And we've already talked about the commandments. We, we read several verses. What are we commanded to do as New Testament Christians? We're commanded to sing. And no evidence is given of there being commandment to use instruments. Uh, simply, uh, instruments aren't found in New Testament worship, and that's why we sing a cappella. That's the, the purpose behind we, us, us doing singing in such a way. But what's the purpose of singing? Christians, 
are to praise God and to teach and admonish one another. And again, some of the most impactful moments of worship are when God's children lift up their collective voice to praise the Father and to edify, challenge, and provoke one another to loving good deeds. So this morning, here in just a second, I'm going to be quiet, and I'm going to get down, and we're going to sing some more. And I want you to realize that, that singing is something God has asked you to do, something God's commanded you to do. And that doesn't mean that you have to have a beautiful voice, but it means if we want to, to be pleasing to God in our worship, we'll sing. And we'll sing to the best of our ability. It doesn't mean you have to sing loud. But focus on the message that's being presented and make sure that as we sing these songs, we, we're singing, challenging one another, encouraging one another, teaching one another, and praising God for all the good things that he has done. So we think about prayer in the worship service. We, we recognize, again, Scripture teaches us that, that prayer is a, a vital part of the Christian's life. Uh, over and over again, just like the as many, if not more, probably many more uh, verses about the importance of prayer and, and how Christians and followers of God have prayed, again, since the very beginning of their time and our time understanding God. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2, it tells us to devote ourselves to prayer. We see in Acts chapter 2, when we think about uh, the early church, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it tells us that they devoted themselves to prayer. From the very beginning of the church and throughout the existence of the church, for as long as that may be, prayer has been extremely important. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, we're told to rejoice always uh, by pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication make your requests made known to God. We see that the, the importance of prayer, the, the opportunity really that we have to talk to God is something that we should, should never take for granted. Uh, and there, there may be times, and, and all of us probably at some point have been guilty of simply going through the motions. Uh, whether that be in our own personal prayers or whether that be at a, a worship service, maybe there's circumstances and things going on in our lives that, that have our minds off kilter, that have our, our spirituality not in line with what it needs to be, and, and perhaps we don't always appreciate what prayer is. Uh, we learn in Luke chapter 5 and verse 16 that even Jesus himself recognized the value of prayer. It says there that Jesus himself would often slip away into the wilderness to pray. When we think about the fact that, that Jesus, God's Son, the one who has had the closest relationship with God of anyone who's ever lived on this earth, he oftentimes took opportunity to, to slip away, to go away privately, to spend some time in prayer to his Father. If, if he needed to do that often, then certainly we would need to do that often. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 2, what are some things that we can pray about? Uh, we give thanks to God, it says there, always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. We need to remember each other and be thankful for each other and pray for each other, oftentimes as we go to God and, and approach Him in prayer. James chapter 5 and verse 16 tells us to confess our sins to one another. Not something that we want to do. Not something probably that any of us look forward to, but, but Scripture tells us, confess your sins to one another. Why? Why would I do that? And pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Prayer is powerful. Prayer can accomplish much, not necessarily because the righteous one is praying it. Remember, Scripture teaches us that there are none righteous, no, not one. But prayer is powerful because when we seek God according to His will, there is a God who answers those prayers. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. We just sang a song, Lord, we come before Thee now. When we think about the, the importance of prayer and, and us uh, approaching God in prayer, us as, as subjects of the kingdom, us as sinful people approaching God, the King approaching God, uh, the perfect being who has always been and will always be, uh, what gives us the right to pray to God? Uh, how do we have that opportunity? We think about back to the story of, of Esther in the Old Testament. You remember her, her worry and her concern to her, her, her cousin Mordecai of, you know, the king hasn't called me and there's only one law that if you come before the king without being called, you'll be killed. Uh, we, we recognize that, that situation that, that Esther recognized that she would be putting her life on the line if she dare approach the king on his throne. But in some ways, that's what you and I are doing every time we approach God in prayer. We're approaching the throne. So what gives us the right to do that? In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, notice what it says. 
Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a, such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, here's the reason, therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. What gives you the right? What gives me the right? Here in a second as we're led in prayer collectively, what gives us the right to dare approach the King of Kings, to dare approach the Creator of all things, and, and, to, and, and to dare to tell Him, God, here's what we think we need. God, we, we need these things from You, and, and You're the only one that can provide them. Why, why would we do that? What would give us the right to? And not only to go, but, but notice what it says again in verse 16, let us draw near with what? With confidence. The reason we can have confidence to approach the throne of grace is because of Jesus Christ. Again, he's, he's the reason for all things as Christians, isn't he? But he, he is the one who gives us the, the chance, the opportunity to, to approach God in his, on his throne, in his temple, in heaven above. When we pray, we need to be mindful of, of the needs. We've got a long prayer list in, in our current bulletin, and the, the old bulletin even had folks that, that had been on our, our prayer list for, for a long time, people that need, are in need of constant prayer. And, and, and we know of people in your life that they're on the bulletin and that may, maybe no one else knows about, people who, who have prayer needs, who, who need God to, to help them in their given situation. We can look around in our community and recognize that there are things not just in our world, not just in our nation, not just in our state, but there are things that are happening right here in Rock Hill, perhaps even in the community that the neighborhood you live in, that there are people who need God to pray for. And certainly we can always pray for the church and the great mission of the church to reach the lost. We need to be mindful of needs. Here's, here's a fact about prayer. When's God, when God's people seek God's blessings according to God's will, the results will be indescribable. Will be incredible. Think about this. God, God wants to answer our prayers to help us accomplish His will. So when we seek His blessings according to His will, the things that, that we know He wants for us and that we know that, that He wants us to accomplish, God wants us to do those things. This, this indescribable, this incredible results, these come from prayer, asking God and our obedience, our willingness to do this. So here in a minute, we're going to go to God in prayer. Remember, you are approaching the king on his throne. And the only thing that gives us that opportunity to do that is the blood of Jesus Christ. First Corinthians chapter 15, Paul talking to the, the church at Corinth, a church that had a number of issues with the partaking of the Lord's Supper uh, mentions to them that the first thing that he mentioned to them, the first thing that he taught them was the gospel of Christ, the good news of Christ. And it says, Therefore I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. Here, Scripture defines for us what is the gospel. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we gather around this table, as we think about the, the bread representing Jesus' body and the fruit of the vine representing the blood that was shed on the cross, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're remembering. That's why we're here, remembering the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, a, a perfect man that can't be said about anyone else who's ever lived, uh, that God came to this earth and lived a perfect life and died and through the power of God resurrected again. You can read about the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, the first few verses. There are some folks that are going there uh, to see him on the first day of the week, to, to see the grave, to see how he's doing, to see if he's been taken care of. And we read in those verses that there's an earthquake and an angel appears and, and, and the people that are going there, they're afraid and the guards themselves who are guarding the tomb of Jesus, they're, they're, they're so afraid, they're like statues, like, like dead men it says. But then the angel says, don't be afraid. Jesus whom you're seeking, he's not here. He's risen. And in that instance, when Jesus resurrected from the grave, when a dead man came back to life, when God, who was dead physically, came back to life, you and I and all mankind experienced the birth of hope of heaven. 
And when we gather around this table, that's what we're doing every time, remembering, proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. We see in Scripture in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 that they, on the first day of the week they were gathered together to break the bread. We see an example of them partaking of the Lord's Supper. Uh, we, we recognize again that the early church e exemplifies this for us. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 46, it talks about how uh, they spent time together. The early Christians spent much time together. It says, day by day, continuing with, with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with glad and sincere hearts. We see that Christians were spending time together. Perhaps specifically the apostles were sharing meals in people's houses, but that's not talking about the Lord's Supper. And that's important because separately... It mentions breaking bread again, so it's not talking about eating together. It's not talking about going out to a restaurant together or going over to someone's house and, and partaking of a meal. It says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, which we referenced earlier, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to the breaking of the bread, and to prayer. And that, that article there, the, that's, that's in the original language. It, it's not in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, where they were breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together. But it is in Acts chapter 2, and verse 42, where they were devoted to breaking the bread. It's talking about something specifically. It's talking about the communion. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 20, Paul tells the, the Corinthians there that, therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. He, he's telling them, you should be meeting together to eat the Lord's Supper, but you're not. He's telling them, in essence, you're doing it wrong. You're not focusing on the right things. You're not partaking of the Lord's Supper in the right way. They were coming together, and basically, they were just having a meal. They weren't thinking about one another. They weren't keeping each other in mind. They were not partaking of the Lord's Supper in a right way. Why do we partake of the bread? Why do we partake of the fruit of the vine? The reason is that Jesus commands us to. It's not just the example that we have. Jesus commands us to. In Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20, it says there, uh, again, referencing the, the, the Last Supper, representing the, representing the time when Jesus has gathered with his disciples in Luke 22, 19 and 20. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Here is when he, he begins. He institutes the Lord's Supper. And it, it's interesting that he says, Take this in remembrance of me. Uh, and, of course, we know the apostles don't even understand that he's about to die yet. So they don't, they don't fully understand the commandment that's given to them. But here now, we today on the, the other side of history, we can recognize this. Also in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 26, a, a passage that's often read before uh, the Lord's Supper, Paul tells his version of it, how, how he received it. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then verse 26 tells us about our observance of the Lord's Supper. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. When we gather around this table today and any time that we gather around the Lord's table and remember him, we're proclaiming the Lord's death. We're remembering what he has done for us. Communion is commanded by Jesus. It's taught by the apostles. It's observed by the early church when they assembled on the first day of the week. And that's important. It's important that we do it because it's commanded. But what I really want us to think about this morning as we begin to partake of it, as we, we get ready to partake of the, the, the fruit of the vine and the, and the bread, is what, what, what occurs in communion? He's also already said to observe this Lord's Supper, to proclaim his death on the Lord's day, the day of his resurrection on Sunday, that declares the gospel, the most important thing, remember Paul told the Corinthians. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, turn there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let's look at verses 16 and following it and recognize a few things that happen as you and I partake of this communion. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16 it says, is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? When we, here in just a few moments, partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine, we will commune, we will join together with, we will have relationship with Christ. 
We share in the, the body of Christ, re remembering and recognizing his purity, that perfect sacrifice on the cross. And we also remember the blood of Christ, which also has to do with purity, but not, not his purity, our need for purity. When we partake of the, the, the bread representing his perfect body, in essence, it should remind us of the fact that we're not perfect. And when we partake of the, the blood, it should remind us of the fact that he had to die on the cross so that we could be purified, so that we could be who God wants us to be. The emphasis, when we partake of these, these emblems, the emphasis must be on the, not on the supper of the Lord, but rather on the Lord of the supper. Not on the emblems, but rather on Emmanuel, God with us. We need to remember Jesus. We need to remember him as we partake of these emblems. We also commune with one another. Notice what it says in verse 17. Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we are all partake of the one bread. So we not only recognize and remember Jesus and commune with Jesus, but as we partake of this, we commune with one another. This, is, this could be, in essence, you, me looking at you or you looking at me and recognizing that I need Jesus, and so do you. And that because of that, we need each other. We recognize our, our own sins. We recognize our own shortcomings. And, and while we may not know specifics, here, here's a, a secret. I know you're not perfect. You know I'm not perfect. And when we partake of these, we, we declare our imperfection. We declare our need for Christ and our need also for one another. We, we can commune with one another. And also we commune not with the world, but rather with God. Look at verse 21. It says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. We, we remember and recognize that we are different than the world around us. That we have a, a place at God's table, not a place at the table of the world. Remembering Jesus, declaring the gospel, communing with God, with one another, and by observing the Lord's Supper is the most important thing that we do each Sunday. Listen to that again. When we partake of this Lord's Supper, communing with Christ, communing with one another, it is the most important thing that we do every Sunday. Scripture seems to teach that it is the reason that the church came together on the first day of the week. Now, we've already talked about singing. We've already talked about prayer. We'll talk about giving, and we'll talk about preaching here in a little bit. All things that we do on the first day of the week, all things exemplified in Scripture that we should do and commanded in Scripture that we should do, but the reason they came together on the first day of the week was to partake of the Lord's Supper. Sometimes, if there's anything that maybe we go through the motions about or that we rush through, maybe it's the table of our Lord when it is the thing we must not rush through. We must not simply go through the motions. We must remember that it is the reason that we come together. Partaking of this reminds us of who we are, reminds us of whose we are. It resets our minds that are often distracted and rekindles our love and dedication to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as you partake this morning, remember Jesus. You are proclaiming his death and your need for his death as we partake of these emblems. Would you pray with me? Separate and apart is a phrase that's often used during this time of our worship, and it's, uh, it's meant to uh, communicate the idea that we've, we've just finished up the, the act of worship, of partaking of the Lord's Supper, of proclaiming the Lord's death, and, and now we're about to, to move into a separate act of worship, uh, uh, an act of worship that's uh, apart from it. And, and, and we do this really for convenience sake. <clears throat> so that the men who are serving can, can come back down front and, and grab the collection trays and we don't have to get them to sit down and come back up or some other way. This is really just for a, a convenience sake, but, but offering should not be something necessarily that's convenient. It should be something that we look forward to. It should be something that, uh, that, that we want to do, that we, we do with a cheerful heart, as Scripture teaches us, but not always something that's convenient. We know Jesus teaches in many places about the importance of giving, in Luke chapter 3 and verse 11, he says, The man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and he who has food is to do likewise. We see the importance that Jesus says, if you see people in need around you and, and you have more than what you need, certainly you, you share with them what they may need. 
Paul tells the Ephesians in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35 that Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We remember those words, don't we? We remember that's something that, that sticks with you. It's a simple, short little phrase that teaches us an important lesson, uh, that, that giving is more important than getting, even though our world today doesn't seem to uh, prescribe to that idea. Specifically about the collection and the command that we're given in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, again, a, a verse that we're familiar with because of this act of worship. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, concerning the collection, as I directed the churches of Galatia, he tells the, the church at Corinth, I've already told the churches in Galatia this. This is something for, for all churches, all of the churches of Christ. So do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collection can be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. We learn from this verse and perhaps from other verses. Here, here's the, the information we know about the collection. A collection is to be made for a need. Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, there was, a, there was a famine in the land of Judea. So that the Christians in, in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem, they were taking up a collection so they could send money to the Christians around that area so they could buy food because there was a famine. But a collection is to be made specifically for some need. Perhaps that's a famine. Perhaps it's the spreading of the gospel. Perhaps it's benevolence. There's a, a need that is met through the collection that collection is to be made on the first day of the week. I think this is perhaps one of the strongest arguments about partaking of the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week because we see they came together for the purpose, as we already talked about, the main purpose they came together on the first day of the week was to partake of the Lord's Supper. And he says on the first day of every week, a collection is to be made. Why, why, why does that make sense? Because they're already gathered together. Again, somewhat of a matter of convenience. When you gather together, on the first day of the week because you're going to be doing that to pro proclaim the Lord's death to partake of the Lord's Supper go ahead and take up the collection that day it's just a practical idea then it also teaches us that each one of us is to give us as he or she may prosper <clears throat> the fact is that I can't tell you how much you should give our elders can't tell you how much you should give even the New Testament doesn't specifically give us a, an amount or percentage that, that you are to give in the Old Testament there was a, a tithe a, a tenth and so the, the, the mindset of some, which I think is a, a good mindset, a logical mindset, that if the Old Testament was, it was good, but it's certainly not as good as the New Testament, and if they gave 10% in the Old Testament, maybe we should give more, but that's not binding scripturally. I think it's a good idea. I think it makes logical sense, but that's not binding scripturally. That doesn't say that specifically. Uh, but well, what are we supposed to give? How are we supposed to give? In Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, Jesus there on the Sermon on the Mount tells the people, don't give like the, the hypocrites do. Don't give like the Pharisees do. Because when they give, they sound a trumpet. They stand on the street corner and they're about to give food to the poor or, or money to the needy. They, they sound a trumpet and say, look at me and look at the good that I'm doing. So certainly we can't give with the purpose of look at how much I'm giving or look at how good I am. But turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want you to read this with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, Jesus tells us that those people who, who sound the trumpet and, and are noticed by men, they have their reward. Basically, they've lost a reward of heaven. They've got their reward. The, the acclaim that they may receive, their appreciation that they may receive, may receive that they've got their reward. But what does giving do? In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 8, let me suggest to you that our giving shows us the proof of our love for God. That there is a correlation. There is a correlation between our love for God, our dependence upon God, our faith in God, and what we give, and vice versa. What we give shows us, maybe not anybody else, but it shows us how much we love God, how much we care about God, how much we trust God. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 8. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you. Now, let me stop there. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, concerning the collection for the saints. Who is he writing to? The Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, who is he writing to? The Corinthians, same people. He talks a lot about the need to give and, and their attitude of giving. Uh, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in, the, in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. They were dealing with affliction, 
They were dealing with poverty, but they had joy and they gave liberally. Verse 3, For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. They wanted to give. They begged to have the opportunity to give despite their circumstances. Verse 6, And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave of themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. There's, There's the key. That verse is the key of this passage. Why were they willing to give despite their poverty? Why were they willing to give despite their affliction? Why were they willing to give despite their circumstances? Because first of all, the first thing they give, the most important thing they gave, wasn't their money. It was themselves. They gave themselves to God. And when they did that, giving of money wasn't a problem. Helping people in need wasn't a problem. They first gave themselves to God. Verse 6, so we urge Titus that, he, that as he previously made a, a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. But just as you abound, he's talking to the Corinthians and he's, saying, he's going to say some good things about them. But just as you abound in everything, in faith and in utterance and in knowledge and in all earnestness and in love, we, we inspire in you. See also that you abound in this gracious work. You see, you, he says to them, you, you are abounding in this, and you've got this under control, and you do all of these things very well. Make sure you do this well, too. Make sure you give well. And then verse 8, I'm not speaking this as a command, okay? So there's not a command, but as a proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. He says, look to what the Macedonians did. They proved their love for God through their willingness to give And Paul tells the Corinthians, and you can do the same thing. So this morning, as we pass out this collection tray, uh, there's there's no set amount. There are needs. Uh, There there are all kinds of needs. If you want to look at the budget or talk to the elders about where where this money goes, it goes to to good efforts and good ways to really to to try and expand the borders of the kingdom. That's the, the main effort, the main need that is today. But we want to make sure that we give to these needs and give cheerfully as it tell, tells us to in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. So whatever you've decided this morning to give, give it cheerfully, not grudgingly, not as, as one that you feel like you have to give something, but recognize also that it is a proof, a, a, a proving of your love for God. I know what some of you are thinking. Won't it be grand to hear him say, let's stand and sing? I know. I'm not planning on preaching a 30-minute sermon. We're going to just talk briefly about uh, the importance of preaching. Preaching is something that uh, we witness, we recognize, we see exemplified and commanded, uh, again, as a part of our New Testament worship. I think one of the ways we see this is on the Great Commission. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus there, of course, talking to the apostles and uh, talking to us as well, go therefore... And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, while not all preaching is evangelistic, perhaps even this morning not necessarily an evangelistic sermon, but notice that, that second part, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. There's more to learn after we become Christians. So one of the reasons that the, the earliest church met together and talked about Scripture and studied the Scripture is the same reason that you and I do it, because we need to continue to learn more and more about God and all that He has commanded us to do. Turn with me to one passage, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's read verses 16 through chapter 4 and verse 4. 2 Timothy 3, 16. Again, you know these first couple of verses especially well, and perhaps even the, the later verses. It says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Why? Why do we need to, to know the Scripture? Verse 17. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Knowing God's Word helps us to be ready to live the life that God wants us to live. And then Paul tells specifically Timothy, a preacher, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing in His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come... The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn aside, uh, turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. The importance of preaching is that you and I know what God says, and that we determine and we make up our minds whether or not we're going to do it. 
a couple thousand years ago almost. Paul tells Timothy, there's going to come a time, and that time has long since come, when most people, even most people who, who claim to be followers of Christ, really don't want to know what the Bible says, really don't want to know what God says, really don't want to know what Christ's commandments are. And he warns the preacher at least, and by extension, he warns all of us, you don't be that way. You make sure that you preach the word in season and out of season when it's convenient and when it's inconvenient. When people want to listen to you and when people aren't interested in what you're saying. Because they need to know, we need to know, the world needs to know the truth of God's word so that we can make our decision. Are we going to follow it or are we not? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 27. That's the, the, the story, the, the part, the, the parable, if you will, of the, the wise and foolish builders. He says that the one who hears these words of mine and acts on them, he'll be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains came and the floods rose and, and the, the, wa the waves and the wind beat against that house. But it didn't fall because it was founded upon, it was built upon the rock. The foolish man, he'll be compared to... The one who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them, he'll be compared to the foolish man who built his house on the sand. He built it up just the same way that the, the wise man did. But when the, the rains came and the floods came and the wind fell against that house, his house fell because it wasn't founded on anything solid. But that is, that's our lives today. And the reason that preaching is important and the reason that we have taken the time even this morning to talk about why do we do what we do in our worship is because if our worship isn't what God has asked for according to His Word, then we're building a worship service on sand. A worship service that won't make its way into heaven to please God. A worship service that if God recognized or if God saw it, He wouldn't recognize it as the worship He asks for. We want to do, I want to do, and I believe you want to do, just only what God wants us to do because we want to be pleasing in His sight. That relates to our worship. That relates to salvation. That relates to our relationships. We want to be who God wants us to be. And the only way we know that is through the study of God's Word. And that's why preaching, that's why teaching, that's why studying God's Word is so important. This morning, I thank you for your, your patience. I hope that you have recognize the importance of what we've done this morning, to, to recognize the importance of our worship. And I hope this morning that, that you will think about how you worship God, not only today, but every time you, we come together as the church. How do we worship God? And is it pleasing to Him? Not necessarily is it pleasing to me. And if our minds are in the right place and our hearts in the right place, both those things will be true. It will be pleasing to God and it will be pleasing to us. If you're not a Christian this morning, how does God tell us to become a Christian? Well, he tells us that we have to have faith that Jesus Christ is the resurrected Son of God. We have to repent and live life His way. We have to confess His name and confess Him as our Lord. And we have to submit to baptism where we come in contact with His blood, which washes away all of our sins. And then we become Christians. And after we do that, what do we do? We continue to learn everything that He has commanded us and follow it to the best of our ability so that we can be pleasing in His sight. So this morning, if you're not a Christian and you want to become one, we want to show you what the Bible says verse by verse, what you need to do, and leave you with a decision of whether you're going to do it or not. Uh, brothers and sisters, if, if you've got struggles this morning, or perhaps even in the midst of our talking about worship, you could recognize that, that your worship in the past, or perhaps even your worship today, hasn't really been, maybe you've done the right things, but you haven't done it with the right mindset, haven't approached God in the right way, you get that right. Get that right through prayer and asking God for forgiveness. If you need to, to let us know that and to ask for help, we would love to talk to you about any of those things and to be here for you. Brothers and sisters, let's continue on our way to heaven according to the path, the map, the trail that God has blazed for us. If you have any needs, we invite you to come.